So welcome back. And uh, well, we will now start session number one. Uh, the, the panel is named Prospects on Floating Offshore Wind in the Coming Years. And the moderator is João Maciel. João Maciel is part of the board uh, of EDP New. Welcome, João. And welcome to all the speakers participating in this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. <clears throat> Good morning, João. Good morning to all. The screen is yours. So good luck. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, good morning or good afternoon to, to all the participants. Um, I would like to welcome you also to, to the Wayback Annual Seminar um, this year in cooperation with, uh, with Japan. And also to welcome you to, to session one on prospects on floating offshore wind in the coming years. Um, today with me, I will have Kiyoiku Ko, uh, Managing Director of Future Energy Consultants. Izafumi Manabe, President and CEO of Marubeni Offshore Wind Development Co Corporation. My colleague, José Pinheiro, Country Manager for Southern Europe uh, at Ocean Winds. And David Edwards, uh, Senior Business Development Manager for Japan and Asia uh, at Principal Power. But I, I will present them properly as we go. Um, first, I would like to, to thank Wayvec again for, for organizing this seminar. Um, for inviting me to, to moderate the session uh, and also more importantly to continue to be a, a driving force in the development of offshore renewables uh, in Europe and in, in the world. Um, I will, I, I remember well the day, uh, let's say in April 2008, when uh, Professor Antonio Sarmento introduced TDP and, and Principal Power, the, the technology company behind the, the wind float project. And, and, when, and at that time when, when the, the wind float was presented to, to us. Uh, a lot has happened since 2008. Um, and I'm really glad to be here today with all of you discussing the future of floating uh, offshore wind uh, in the world. Um, so just some brief remarks from my side before I, I, I give the word to my, to my guests here. Um, we all acknowledge that offshore wind uh, will be one of the, the key pillars for renewables, which as you, we all know is a core a vector for the energy transition. Um, offshore wind is, is currently at around 30 gigawatts of installed capacity, more or less. And there are many estimates for and targets for floating offshore wind and its relative share in, uh, renewable, uh, in, renewable, in offshore renewables. Um, if we think in 2050, for sure, we will have, we will see estimates for hundreds of gigawatts of offshore uh, wind and floating offshore wind having a, a very relevant role in offshore renewables. As was already said today, uh, technologies will need to mature and industrialize, costs will need to come down. But my, my firm belief is, is that the industry is, is uh, walking this, this path. Um, there are more than, on, in floating offshore wind in particular, there are more than 30 projects under, uh, projects under development. Uh, I think around 15 of them grid connected from nine different uh, projects. And, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, during the course of our session today, we will learn a lot more about the industry and the technology. Just some very, very quick housekeeping rules. Uh, we'll have four uh, 10 minutes each uh, presentations, followed by a 20 minutes period for, for question and answers. Um, feel free to all the participants to, to start writing your questions as we go on the Q&A tab on the, on the platform. And we will try to address them at the end of the four, of the four uh, presentations. So let me, let me move forward to, to present our first, uh, our first uh, speaker. So Mr. Kiyohiko Ko um, had, had been working at, at one of uh, Japanese major general trading company, Sogo Shosha, for 30 years where he had been developing big oil and gas and chemical projects, mainly in Africa, Middle East, and former Eastern Europe. And during that period, he had been living in London for nine years. After that, he had been working as an executive in, in charge of business development at Japanese shipyard over eight years, where he had been developing offshore wind and marine renewable energy technologies and projects. After retirement from Japanese shipyard, he has established an independent consulting company, in the field of renewable energy, mainly offshore wind and marine renewable energy, 
and he has been actively working as the bridge between Japanese industry and European renewable industry in order to accelerate development of offshore wind and marine renewable energy in Japan. Kiyohiko, thank you very much for joining us and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for introducing uh, me and the... Uh, okay, can you see my screen? I will put this... Yes, yes, correct. Okay, all right, Please, okay. Yes. Thank you very much for introducing me. Uh, my name is Kiyo Hikoko. I am independent consultant uh, in the field of renewable energy. I'm based in Tokyo, Japan. And the, first of all, I'd like to uh, express my deepest thanks for the organizing this seminar and organizer Webek and also um, uh, Embassy of Japan and Portuguese. I'm very pleased to give you some uh, a short uh, presentation about uh, perspective on floating offshore wind in Japan. And the, uh, just I would like to firstly highlight, and partly already our ambassador mentioned that uh, the, some kind of background of a very strong announcement or commitment made by Japanese government, which is a uh, strong support for offshore wind and uh, uh, in Japan. As uh, ambassador mentioned that already our government has committed carbon neutral by 2050, and also, uh, even uh, during COP26, our government has committed to reduce C GHG emission by 46% in 2030 in comparison with 2013. And even they are challenging further reduction by 50%. This is a very uh, kind of uh, uh, cornerstone of our uh, company's policy, uh, country's policy. And based on this kind of uh, uh, so-called energy transition or uh, CO2 emission reduction policy, uh, our company, our country has established several uh, policy related to the energy and the uh, green growth. And the first one is six energy basic policy, which is really announced by our government. I will touch upon later what is that. Then also based on this energy policy, in order to accelerate uh, green growth, uh, government has announced so called green growth strategy and which is supported by the uh, very big green innovation fund, also which I'm going to explain to you a bit further. And uh, on top of that, uh, our offshore wind vision, industry vision has been announced last year. This is a so-called Japanese version of sector deal happened in UK, which is a kind of commitment by both government and industry for offshore wind. Then uh, lastly, uh, in order to uh, make this commercial wind farm to be built, Japanese government has uh, made a significant change of the law for offshore wind promotion zone, both in port area and general ocean, ocean area through the auction system. Also, I will touch upon the uh, current situation of this auction later. Firstly, uh, at the latest uh, so-called so six energy basic policy, uh, Japanese government has uh, clearly mentioned our targeted uh, renewable energy is, uh, uh, kind of uh, ratio for the power generation up to 36 to 38 percent by 2030. And it is notably said that uh, within this 36 to 38 percent, it is said offshore wind need to be, uh, uh, need to have some share of approximately 5 percent, which is equal to 5.7 gigawatt. But this is kind of uh, just uh, basic policy and the, our plan is much bigger than that. And the, e, e, as I said, you know, uh, green growth strategy, there is a very uh, important five policy tools for Japanese government to proceed green growth uh, policy. Grant funding, tax incentive, guidance policy on finance and regulatory reform and international collaboration. And just I would like to uh, touch upon this first Green Innovation Fund. This is a very important to accelerate R&D toward the commercialization of renewable energy. And uh, this is the uh, main 14 growth sector for which this Green Innovation Fund will be utilized. As you can see, uh, the top of the top on the left, offshore wind power is a uh, uh, number one uh, category on energy field apart from uh, uh, any other uh, area. And for that reason, uh, after, uh, within this so-called Green Innovation Fund budget, uh, total budget is about 
2 trillion yen, 2,000 billion yen, which will be spent over 10 years from now on in order to accelerate development and the commercialization of offshore wind. And the, uh, according, uh, within this 2 billion yen, and the offshore uh, uh, 120 billion yen has been allocated for the offshore wind cost reduction project, which project has been uh, is designed for two phases. Phase one is uh, for first three to five years uh, for the R&D for the in, uh, individual technological elements such as wind turbine and floating foundation and electric system and improvement on M. As you might have noticed that the floating is uh, highlighted on number two. This is a very important aspect for us to, for you to understand. Then after three to five years R&D, uh, it is planned to uh, make at least two demonstration projects of floating wind for which uh, 85 billion yen budget has been allocated. Therefore, it, it is important to proceed good R&D toward the successful demonstration project, which will happen three to five years later. And the, after 2030, uh, the, some commercial uh, floating offshore wind will be in, in place in Japan. This is a kind of long-term vision of the uh, Japanese government under this green, you know, uh, green growth policy. And uh, this is the uh, offshore wind industry vision, so-called Japanese version of uh, sector deal, uh, uh, in, uh, in, which has happened in the UK, and where the government has committed a target uh, size of projects to be uh, planned by 2030 is 10 gigawatt by 2030. This is the number of projects to be planned by that time. And even further, by 2040, 30 to 40 gigawatt of offshore wind project need to be uh, formed. And while the industry side is, has committed that we are trying to make our local contents up to 60% by 2040, and uh, industry will make endeavor to reduce the cost of uh, uh, mainly fixed bottom type of offshore wind uh, down to eight to nine yen per kilowatt hour by 2030 to 2035. And notably here is next generation technology. Uh, we, uh, it is clearly said, floating wind is uh, most in, one of the most important next generation technology to be developed for our country. And uh, this is uh, uh, this uh, image of distribution of the uh, targeted project in Japan. Uh, by 2030 is a pink one, and by 2040 is green one. These kind of things, you can see the distribution of uh, uh, project to be formed by, let's say, 2040. And the, uh, uh, as I said, Japanese government has changed the law to start auction process, as similar to European is doing. And for that, already round one has been started. And now the, uh, under the final evaluation of selection of the uh, developer, these four, sorry, this is a bit small, small, but I hope you can understand there are four projects here is online. Uh, most likely at the end of this year or early part of uh, next year, uh, the winner developer will be uh, nominated, designated uh, through the tender procedure for this full site. And government has committed to uh, uh, pro uh, continue this kind of auction round uh, for another 10 years. Uh, in the range of one to two gigawatt per year. Therefore, still uh, next round of candidate site is already listed here, for which now the local stakeholder engagement, so-called a uh, local council meeting is held. And upon finishing these kind of things, uh, possibly next year, the auction for this uh, area will be announced. And uh, uh, these kind of thing is followed the here, and this will be continued until 2030 in order to reach uh, 10 gigawatt of project planning. Then uh, this is a, a kind of industrial uh, uh, investigation made by Japan Wind Power Association. This is the highlight that fixed bottom potential is 128, while I like to highlight floating is much bigger, 424 gigawatt. 
because of our landscape and the, even uh, 2050, the industry is looking for uh, 90 gigawatt of offshore wind. Most likely, they have more than half of them might be floating. And this is some summarize of some floating wind development project already executed in Japan. As you know, famous Fukushima has been started 2011. And uh, this is the uh, NEDO project uh, using, uh, uh, maybe you may be familiar with this floating uh, technology developed in France, is now underway. And the, in the Goto Island, already a Japanese type of spar project has been finished. And this will be enter into the commercial phase very soon. Uh, this is the, what we are going to do, that, which means I like to highlight uh, offshore wind, particularly floating wind, is a, a heavy, uh, badly needed for Japan to achieve our goal. And uh, thank you very much. This is my short presentation. Uh, I'd like to hand it over uh, this to uh, the moderator again. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kiyohiko, for the perfect timing and, and the great presentation. Good to see the, the plans for Japan, some uh, highlights on projects, and the fact that uh, with this green, uh, uh, what do you call it? green innovation fund, so fun. it, it's putting the R&D money where, to support strategy. Very, very interesting. Um, and I think this is, a, this is, in fact, a good segue for the following presentation where we will deep dive in some of the, in some of the Japanese projects. Um, so thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm glad now to, to present uh, Mr. Isafumi Manabe. Um, so uh, from uh, Marubeni Offshore Wind Development Corporation, as I said, um, over 20 years of international and domestic business experience at Marubeni Corporation for several sectors, including telecom, IT, finance, smart grid, power and renewable energy, including PV, hydro, wind, and geothermal. Um, being in charge of several offshore wind projects, such as uh, Akita Noshiro as project manager, uh, Fukushima floating, and near the floating pilot project in Japan. From April 2017, Manabe has been a, a board of directors member of Akita Offshore Wind Corporation. So, uh, Mr. Izafumi Manabe, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you very much for kind of inter introduction and uh, thank you very much for the uh, arrangement of the webinar and uh, uh, giving me the great opportunity uh, today. Uh, my name is Hisa Fumi Manabe, uh, or the president of the CEO of Marvin Offshore Wind Development Corporation. I'd like to make some uh, brief presentation about Marvin's activity in wind power business and uh, some specific projects uh, in Japan as well as the, uh, some the activity in outside of Japan. So as a first of all, I'd like to explain the, uh, who we are, the Marubeni Corporation. Uh, we, uh, Marubeni Corporation uh, is the one of the uh, largest Japanese general trading company founded in 1858. So uh, actually this is a general trading house. So our activity is widely spread like food, chemical, energy, and we belong to power business. So this slide uh, covers some floating uh, project in Japan, as Mr. Ko briefly touched uh, previously. So uh, after the Fukushima disaster, uh, which happened uh, in 2011, we have started the Fukushima, the floating offshore wind farm back in 2013. So as you can see on the uh, top side, uh, we have the formed consortiums, <clears throat> which is consisted by University of the Tokyo, uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, and the Mitsubishi Ship, and Japan United, Japan Marine Unit Corporation, etc. And Marvin's role is the project integrator. And we have installed the four floater and three turbines on the top of that. So one floater is just for the uh, offshore substation. Uh, this is the first case of the floating the offshore substation. 
And from 2019s, uh, uh, we uh, have started the next pilot project called Kita Kyushu Floating Osha Wind System. So as you can see in the right bottom side, this is the two blades turbine that come from Germany. And we install the uh, dumping pool, the type the floater in the bottom. And uh, for both projects, uh, our role is project integrator. Actually, the, we are leading the consortium to the, uh, execute the projects and uh, uh, economic feasibility study of the projects. And after these two pilot projects, we started the one commercial scale project, which is Akita Noshiro. So actually, this is the first commercial large scale offshore wind project in Japan. So unfortunately, Japan is still the very early stage in terms of the offshore wind, but we have started the construction back in 2020. So this project is relatively small compared to European, but this is actually the first large scale offshore wind project in Japan. So uh, the installed capacity is approximately 140 megawatts. And this is the bottom fixed type. And actually this project consisted by two ports near shore project. So we installed 13 units in Akita port and 20 units in North Shore ports. So this is the last. And this the slide shows our project structures so we have the totally 13 shareholders and the Marvin is leading developer and the largest shareholders. We established the special uh, purpose vehicle, the species, uh, so-called Akita Offshore Wind Corporation. And we uh, ordered the uh, three EPC major contracts to uh, these players, to the contractors the WTG package to Vestas and the OSHA EPCI to Kajima Sumitomo Electric JV and the onshore substation and transmission, the construction to Kinde. And on behalf of SPC, the Marubeni Group company is in charge of the overall the project management, which includes the construction management and the o and them uh, uh, management after the uh, commercial operation. So this is just the uh, image drawing in Akita port and Noshiro ports. So this is actually uh, actual progress. So as I mentioned, totally 33 uh, wind turbine will be installed. So Monopile and the transition piece that has been delivered from Europe to Akita uh, starting the January 2021. And this is an overview of the pre assembly yard in Akita Falls. So, this photo shows some hammering the activities by Shijak Zarada. So, it took about one to three hours per monopile. And after installation of the transition piece, we can see this style over there. So this is an actual photo of Akita port in last September this year. And this is the photo of Notion ports. So we have completed the, all of the installation works for foundation this year as scheduled. And we are uh, conducting some of the laying the cable, subsea cable between the, uh, the piles. And uh, next year, uh, we are going to install the WTG on the top of transition piece by CJAX Zarada as well. So uh, in order to uh, the catch the, our construction work the easily, I just want to show the video so quickly. Sorry, the exploration is 
、ジャパニーズ。そういう。そう、This project is first the commercial scale or showing Um, sorry, we, we are, I mean, at least I am not seeing the, the movie. I'm not sure、okay. if、uh, the other colleagues are. Okay, so I just want to skip and、uh, uh, go to the、uh, conclusion. And in addition to the Japanese projects,、uh, at the COP26 in Glasgow, we just signed a memorandum of understanding with the Scottish Enterprise. And based on this、uh, MOU, we'd like to focus on the decarbonization activity within Scotland, which including floating or showing green hydrogen, or something like that. Yeah, that's all the presentation from.、Uh, uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. And I just want to、uh, hand over to the moderator. Thank you very Thank you. much, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Manabe.、Um, well, very, very interesting to, to view, very interesting view from,、uh, on, the, on the structure of the Akita project, and also to understand the, the vision of a large industrial player such as Marubeni. Thank you, Thank you very much.、Um, I, I suggest now we travel to, to Europe and hear about the The wind float project.、Um, so let me, let me introduce Jose Pinheiro.、Uh, Jose Pinheiro started working for wind turbine supplier Vestas、uh, in 2007 and went through several functions in Spain, Denmark, and Brazil. In 2011, he moved to EDPR based in Madrid, first as a senior technical support engineer and then as a head of operation and maintenance for EDPR's global technical direction. Uh, in 2013, he moved to Scotland and supported the development of what is now today known as the Moray East Offshore Wind Farm,、uh, first as head of wind turbines and substructures, and,、um, and later as project technical coordinator. In April 2017,、um, Jose started leading the, the Wind Float Atlantic project、uh, as project director and managing director of, of Wind Plus, the project company formed to, to develop. Construct and operate the, the Wind Float Atlantic project. More recently, he joined a new company formed between EDP Renewables and Angie called Ocean Winds、uh, as country manager for, for、uh, I guess, Southern Europe.、Um, so, Jose, thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Joao. Nice to see you again.、Um, good morning, everyone.、Uh, <clears throat> I'm hoping that you hear me well. Good afternoon to other of you. Um, and thanks、uh, to the, well, the organization,、uh, WAVEC, of course, and the Japanese embassy.、Um, well, for the kind invitation, thank you very much and in, in, in for organizing once again this seminar, which looks like a tradition.、Uh, um, this year,、um, uh, and I'm just going to、um, plug the, the presentation up. Hopefully, you can see it. Let me know if,、uh, if it's clear. Yes, just put it on presentation mode, please, but it's, we can see it. Okay, good. So, this year I tried to bring the view on how the Wind Float Atlantic is bringing lessons for us to apply in other contexts, clearly. And given the theme of the session, of the seminar, I tried to focus in Japan、uh, and the high potential of, of this market uh, uh, as a country. Where floating offshore wind、uh, just makes sense from every single angle.、Um, so, but first things first,、um, I just wanted for the ones that still don't know who、uh, Ocean Wind is, it's a company that results from a joint venture between EDP Renewables and、uh, Angie.、Um, it was formed back in 2019、um, at the beginning of the pandemic, and, and it's the sole. Vehicle for offshore wind investments for, for both companies. It's based in Madrid and it has been present since the beginning in, in seven countries. And it's just becoming a very growing、uh, company. We are already at least in eight, nine countries already.、Um, so when we 
uh, when we talk about wind flow, we have to go back, uh, as as Joao mentioned in, in the beginning, uh, to the late phase of the uh, of two thousands. Uh, from two thousand and eight onwards, uh, we uh, through EDP at that time um, we ventured into a technology company called, called Principal Power. Um, it uh, owns it owns the floating design concept, and we saw. Uh, the light uh, through a project, a pilot project that, that was uh, installed off the coast of Portugal and uh, from Agosadora. Um, and here's some key uh, characteristics of the project. Well, but the bottom line is that this project showed clearly that the technology worked. Uh, that was the challenge back then, uh, a technology that could prove its reliability uh, uh, in a, in a true uh, marine environment. Um, that led us to continue uh, through the development of wind float Atlantic. It became just a, the natural step. Um, and we, we built a, a three floating platform project uh, sitting in bigger water depths, around 100 meter water depths at 20 kilometers uh, offshore. We did a multi-contract approach to make the, the best of, uh, of that um, contractual approach to, to, to bring the more knowledge as possible, uh, being us a true integrator back then. Um, but more importantly, we, we showed that, again, the technology could work in harsher conditions, in more uh, challenging ones, using the largest commercial turbines uh, ever produced. Um, and, uh, and moreover, we showed us as well that the, the technology could be bankable um, as we were the first and we are still the only floating project that has secured a project finance deal, in this case, 60 million euros with, with the European Investment Bank. Um, so some pictures of, of just the dimensions and how things just went from prototype to the pre-commercial project that is now sitting here off the coast of Portugal. Um, and, uh, and here, uh, I wanna just to address a few um, challenges that we have identified um, for, for the Japanese uh, market, um, but they can, can be also seen as common um, throughout other, other regions um, where we, we think that offshore floating wind makes sense. Um, Japan, it's a highly industrialized country, so there is a true opportunity of developing local supply chain, and that needs to be, to be definitely one of the key drivers from day one, to, to work together with the supply chain, um, having the visibility on a long term of investment to attract the, the local companies to be moved to this, to this new vector of, of energy. The second um, challenge that we have identified was that the, the manufacturing, um, the, 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 it, at the Wind Float Atlantic, the manufacturing of these three platforms showed that it, uh, it was a complex process uh, that needed to be streamlined. Um, hence the, the, the challenge to work in, in optimizing and, and the design for fabrication uh, is a clear goal uh, for us and, and for others that also have mature concepts already out there floating. So, there's definitely the need for a lean approach uh, for, for, for this uh, new phase that uh, would lead uh, the, 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 flat, the platforms to be, let's, let's say, industrialized. And, uh, the, the, the third challenge that we see is, is that the Wind Float Atlantic, we have identified uh, throughout the installation of the wind turbines that we identified before going to the to Ferrol port, uh, we identified this port, this port as being the, the, the most the most uh, the closest one, um, but also the one with better conditions. But then it also came. Uh, we have experienced some hurdles as well. We saw that the, the 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 port, although having good conditions, was a bit exposed to environmental conditions and incoming swells that have made it to be a bit of a challenge. And we also foresee this to be uh, a key point in, in Japan. Um, uh, so being close to, to site is definitely important. 
but also the conditions where you install the wind turbines if you want to do it faster in in in, in a faster mode and in a, in a continuous manner uh, given the large amount of, of units that need to be uh, installed in commercial projects the the conditions need to be uh, as good as as possible so that there is no interruptions in all the logistics the last challenge that I, that i uh, that we have identified in specifically for japan well in japan as opposed to the wind float atlantic project all electrical infrastructure seems to be uh, under the responsibility of the developer uh, that means that design construction and operation will be under the, the development uh, of the developer uh, responsibility um, this is of course a risk that comes uh, at, uh, at the cost but also um, and, and eventually more importantly uh, and it's also common in other regions where offshore floating wind or offshore wind in general is, is starting to be looked at uh, the, the, there is a need a clear need for a, a, an overall uh, approach um, of how these large scale uh, wind farms uh, will be integrated in the national grids. Um, so, for us, the development cycle of floating offshore uh, has been is is a it's it's clearly this one. First, prove the technology, then the, the, its bankability, and to then step up to to commercial projects. Um, this is a clear path, uh, and and we are seeing uh, when we are where we are present where we think that the markets are, are make, make sense, the geography makes sense, we could actually add up here a couple of more flags like, like Greece or Spain, where we also are working and myself, uh, with my team, personally speaking. Um, so, so our presence shows here a great mix of uh, uh, the typical bottom fix, but definitely uh, uh, as a key differentiator to ocean winds, the, the floating uh, technology knowledge um, you can see it already mapped out uh, in our presence in the, in the globe. So, um, for us, the, the three priorities for floating wind in Japan are clearly uh, to show the, that it is possible to reduce the cost, um, then having less units and, and, and bigger units with more capacity, the wind turbines being uh, bigger and bigger, as we see now the next generation uh, of around 15 megawatt already. Uh, brings less units and therefore um, the, the clear reduction of, of costs. The industrialization uh, as well, again, uh, the design needs to be done uh, and, is, and the, the characteristics of the shipyards around uh, the globe need to be uh, the best as possible so that the process is streamlined uh, and of course creating of economics of scale. Uh, that's a true, a true um, a true opportunity here uh, for for uh, for localizing and, and and coming to to create jobs in the in through this new energy vector um, japan is not no, no different from other other regions uh, and very importantly to be, to address from early stages in development the coexistence with the with other industry um, just to give you uh, uh, some numbers the in Japan, as far as I know, as I could understand, have 200,000 uh, fishermen. It's, it's uh, compared to Europe, which has 170. Um, so in one single country, the, we can see how strong is the fishing community. And we need to address that from day one uh, in a coexisting uh, environment. Um, Lastly, for us, offshore wind, sorry, there's some noise in, yeah, thank you. Um, so offshore wind is, is clearly an opportunity uh, for, for, for Japan. Japan is one of the highest population density uh, countries of the world. It has a generation mix, which is pretty much still very much dependent in, on fossil, fossil fuels. Um, and we can see uh, from other neighboring regions how uh, other regions are definitely betting uh, and where ocean winds also is like south korea or uh, in, the, in the case with a, with the large scale developments that will bring uh, offshore floating wind to be really considered uh, an industry so here there's um, definitely a big possibility of japan becoming one of the largest uh, uh, floating offshore markets definitely uh, on the top three 
and uh, our presence already in in this in this country and then that's all for me and i look forward for the for the dialogue further on thank you back to you Joan. thank you very much jose for the interesting presentation and uh, looking at the challenges and lessons learned from the i guess from the windfall project as well i guess as well from your experience in more east uh, in addressing the, the Japanese market, very Japanese market, very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, so we spoke about market projects uh, and now technology. So this leads me to to principal power. Um, the next speaker is David Edwards. Um, so David Edwards is a senior business development manager at Principal Power. He is responsible for business development and partnership activities related to to Japan and Asia. Um, he speaks Japanese fluently and has over 15 years of experience working in Japan, including at leading companies such as Sony and NEC. He graduated from the Stern School of Business at New York University with a master's degree in business analytics. So thank you very much, David. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, uh, Joao, and uh, to all my uh, Japanese colleagues, uh, um, I'll limit my uh, Japanese uh, and uh, switch back to English. Um, in the meantime, let me please uh, share my screen with you. Um, can everyone see my screen? Perfect. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, so uh, the title of my presentation is, uh, you know, Principal Power Wind Float is Ready for Japan. Um, we at Principal Power uh, are very, very excited about the opportunities in uh, the Japanese market. And we have been uh, for a number of years. Uh, we, we've we um, been in Japan um, actively uh, in, with partnerships through with companies like uh, Mitsui Engineering and Shipbuilding and others for a number of years. And of course, most people know about our relationship with Tokyo Gas. But let, let me proceed to the next slide. Um, principal Power, uh, for folks who might not be uh, familiar with us, uh, was founded in 2007. So we're not a new company or we're not a startup. And we've grown to be uh, one of the global leaders in the uh, floating offshore wind industry. Our headquarters is in California, near San Francisco, a, a city called Emeryville in the United States. Um, we have offices, a number of offices in Europe, including in Portugal, in France, in the UK. And we also now have an office in Japan. We have um, over 100 employees, most of which are um, engineers, either marine engineers or you know, um, other uh, engineers related to um, the marine uh, industry with 20 different uh, nationalities, so we're quite diverse. Um, we're backed by um, global um, energy and utility leaders, including my, uh, my friends from uh, OW, uh, Jose, who just um, spoke, uh, but also uh, Tokyo Gas, uh, Ocker, and some of the other uh, folks that uh, you folks uh, know. So we're uh, backed by some of these leaders. We have... Um, a globally patented and proven uh, floating platform technology uh, called wind float, which again, um, I'm sure everyone has heard of. Um, and we have over 105 megawatts of cumulative capacity in operation or under advanced development. So this isn't, um, you know, R&D level uh, technology readiness. This is um, technology that's been deployed in some of the harshest conditions in the world. And now we're uh, working very actively um, on our um, securing pipeline and serving clients in all of the key uh, floating offshore wind markets, including the US, um, France, um, Portugal, the UK, Japan, um, China, all of these markets. Let me continue. Um, our, our platform is called WindFloat. It's proven technology in multiple ocean environments. Uh, we've done designs and we've received class certification for um, ocean environments, including in Asia, um, but also in the North Sea um, and other parts of the world. 
We have um, currently uh, 75 megawatts of cumulative capacity in operation. Um, this is WFA, which Jose just spoke about, um, and KWL, which is our project that just came online uh, recently in Scotland. And we've generated over uh, 65 gigawatt hours of, of um, energy. So this is, again, you can kind of see uh, one of the uh, Windflow Atlantic units, Keyside in Ferrell, Spain in 2019. Um, our solution is um, relatively uh, simple. Um, there are kind of um, four main parts that I'd like to talk about briefly. Um, first of all, um, in terms of our, what kind of wind turbine can be um, attached to a wind float, um, we're very, we're agnostic. We've um, designed uh, for GE turbines, for Siemens turbines, for obviously for MHI uh, Vestas uh, turbines. So any conventional uh, commercial wind turbine um, can be used with a wind float with only some software modifications to our controller um, and you know, um, site-specific power. Another kind of unique point about our solution is we use damping plates. These are these plates um, at the bottom of our three columns of the semi-submersible unit. And what these um, plates are used for is they move the platform in natural response above wave excitation. So essentially, Wave-induced motions are, um, are being dampened by using these plates. So in a sense, it almost kind of gives a, a virtual mass, so to speak, to, to the unit. Um, and then something that's very unique about wind float versus other semi-submersible units is that we use what's called a smart hull trim system, which displaces water between columns using kind of pumps and water uh, running through these, uh, these top columns that you can see here. Um, to compensate for changes in um, wind velocity and uh, changes in wind direction. And so the unit can respond um, and uh, maximize um, energy production. And then finally, uh, we have a passive ballast system, which is located at the bottom of each of our columns. And what that helps to do is that it helps the unit achieve uh, operating draft. So we strongly believe that wind float is ready for the challenges of commercial deployment in Japan for um, five of these reasons, because in Japan, of course, um, financing is key. Um, Japan is a very tough environment, as we all know, with typhoons and earthquakes. Um, but Japanese clients also demand new applications for uh, wind float and any floating technology. Um, they want, uh, Japanese clients want modular technology. Um, they obviously need technology that's ready for deep water deployment. And they need uh, technology that's ready for scale. And I'd like to kind of walk you through some of what we're doing in other environments to show you how we are, in, in fact, ready for Japan. Um, Jose also already spent a little bit of time talking about Windflow Atlantic, but one of the things that I'd like to highlight with Wind Float Atlantic is that, you know, besides being uh, three units, so pre-commercial size, this was all local shipyard construction in Lisnov, uh, Portugal, and Faro, Spain. Um, as uh, Jose had also mentioned, this is the first bank-financed floating uh, wind farm in the world. Uh, this was uh, EIB, this is European Investment Bank, 60 million euro loan that was used to finance this. So this is a bankable technology. And also, um, in terms of Storm Dora, with very challenging conditions in December 2020, 100 kilometer per hour uh, winds, uh, nine meter waves, you can see how the wind float performed. Let me show you the next slide. You can kind of see a video of how the wind float performed. And you see very, you can see very little movement here of these platforms. Again, um, showing you how stable wind float performs even in very challenging conditions. You can see uh, the wind float is in operation during the storm. And let me continue to the next slide. Um, wind float is ready for tough environments and new applications. Um, we have uh, a tough environment like, uh, you know, uh, Scotland where uh, we've just recently um, you know, uh, brought to power uh, the Windflow Kincardine project. This is a 50 megawatt uh, project 
5, 9.5 uh, Vestas V164 turbines. So these are kind of top of class uh, turbines, um, 15 kilometers off the coast of Aberdeen at a depth of uh, 60 to 80 meters. Um, the units were fabricated in Spain, um, but platform turbine integration was done in Rotterdam port. So again, this shows the fact that with a wind float, you can fabricate it in one area and then tow it in new um, integration in another area. And we did this project, this was a, a, a two-phase project, um, but um, it was completed um, even with the challenging uh, COVID uh, pandemic, which, you know, again, we're um, quite proud of. Um, in terms of other applications, um, maybe you've heard of uh, the Dolphin Project in Scotland, which is a floating hydrogen production uh, project where we're using wind float to produce um, hydrogen and then send it to shore. We're using a two megawatt and 10 megawatt system. This is, allows for the generation of other revenues besides electricity, and it helps uh, relieve grid constraints. Um, and then finally, the third project is the Erebus project in Wales, which is um, in uh, southern, you can see it's kind of a southern England where this project will be located. This will be a 96 megawatt project, seven to 10 turbines. Uh, the developer here is Blue Gem Wind, which is a joint venture between um, Simply Blue Energy and Total, uh, 45 kilometers off the coast of Pembrokeshire in Wales. Um, COD on this project is estimated at 2027. And Erebus really represents a stepping stone that's going to allow the local supply chain in Wales to build the capabilities for the delivery of uh, larger projects in this Celtic Sea region in the future. Let me move on. Um, we're ready for modularization. I think we have a project in France, some of you may have heard of, called EFGL. This is a 30 megawatt project. It will be operational in 2023. Um, again, our friends at Ocean Wind um, were uh, involved uh, extensively in this project. This will be three 10 megawatt uh, Vestas units um, certified by BV. Um, the wind float construction took place um, in Foster de Mer or Foster Mer, and log the logistical industrial base was in Port La Nouvelle. Um, again, we there's financing through the EIB and Ademe, which is a, a, a French um, a French company. This was a feed-in tariff through competitive process, somewhat like uh, the Japanese auction process. And the important innovations that we're going to be seeing with EFGL include further um, modularization and um, improvement in manufacturability to increase the deliverability and competitiveness of wind float, which this will be our third generation of wind float technology. And to um, help um, and address some of the concerns of the um, fisheries and um, uh, some of our friends uh, who are other stakeholders in the French, uh, you know, in, in terms of the parks and natural parks in France, we've been deploying, uh, we will be deploying fish nursery habitats called bio huts. Moving on, wind float is certainly ready for deep water deployment and those challenges in Japan. We have two projects, one in uh, California, the other in Hawaii in the US. These are going to be, again, commercial scale projects where we're looking uh, to deploy in waters that are extremely deep, 900 meters um, in, off the Redwood Coast in uh, Northern California and 500 to 1,000 meters in Hawaii. Um, these projects, again, um, are uh, have CODs in 2026 and uh, beyond, but these are commercial scale projects that prove that we're ready for deep water deployment. And then finally, um, to prove that we're ready for scale, we have a project in the, um, in the Asian waters, in the Pacific, uh, through it's South Korea and Ulsan City. This project will be up to 1.2 gigawatts. Um, this is a, you know, going to be a, approximately 100 um, wind turbine generators, turbine units. Floating a LIDAR has already been deployed the depth again is quite deep, 250 meter waters, COD at 2026, and we're working with um, Ocean Wind again. And so this is a project that we're very excited about uh, for commercial deployment. So finally, what I'd like to um, talk about is the opportunity in Japan is just huge, um, 10 gigawatts offshore by 2030. Um, estimates of maybe four gigawatts of floating, maybe coming towards uh, closer to 2030. 
um, than, uh, than today, um, but up to 45 gigawatts by 2040. And we believe that a significant amount of that is gonna be floating given constraints in Japan, um, including deep water and strong wind speeds, and also very shallow ports in Japan to which uh, semi-submersible wind flow technology is very well suited. Um, wind float again is proven technology. Um, we believe that the grid challenges in Japan can be resolved. Um, there already talk of a, um, a high voltage uh, DC connection between Hokkaido where there's great wind in deeper water and Tokyo where there's significant demand. Um, Principal Power's wind float technology is designed for typhoons and earthquakes. We've received uh, class NK uh, certification on our units in the past. Um, you can use wind float in shallow ports, which is key in Japan. And we believe that the Japanese uh, supply chain is ripe for modularization and to be developed to maximize local content. And finally, necessary components we also believe are in, um, in place in Japan. The regulatory regime, which uh, uh, Kosan um, talked about earlier, is very supportive of floating offshore wind technology. We're seeing a very strong pipeline of projects um, coming through with our clients. Uh, we're seeing big ambition for commercial scale projects and reducing LCOE. And then finally, we see the pieces coming together with the Japanese government, very supportive of um, port infrastructure and supply chain investment. And so um, you can see from these two graphs down here that Japan has certainly deeper water and um, some of the best wind in Japan is found in this deeper water. So thank you very much. Um, and I uh, look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, it's great to see the developments of one of the, let's say the technology champions of the, of the sector. Thank you very much for your for your very good presentation. Um, so let's let's move now to the the Q and A uh, part of the session. Uh, I think we have approximately twenty minutes as as planned. So thanks of all for keeping the the time. We have already I think ten questions in our in our Q and A, and I'll I'll address them let's say chronologically. Uh, I, I suggest um, all the speakers open their cameras now so that we can. You know, emulate uh, <laughs> around the table uh, session. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, thank you very much. So I'll I'll start with the with the first question, which is for uh, Jose Pinheiro. Uh and the question is uh, whether Ocean Winds is planning to use uh, principal power technology in uh, in Japan, or if or if you have any other plans. Okay, so. Well, as uh, as ocean winds through EDP renewables is uh, uh, one of the uh, main shareholders of principal power, and and having of course on the backpack over ten years of experience with this technology, uh, being uh, an investor and 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 a vehicle of of this technology development and and to achieve this maturity, it's only normal that we have principal power. Uh, design handy, <laughs> at least it's the least that I can say, handy to 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 perceive and and to develop our our ideas in Japan definitely. On a longer run, I believe that ocean winds will become very much uh, uh, a, a a floating platforms agnostic player, such as the, uh, the same thing that happens with the wind turbines. But in Japan, uh, and you could see clearly also from the presentation of my. Of uh, of the 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 last presentation, uh, uh, David Edwards, right? It was very clear uh, where the technology is and and uh, how much we uh, as a shareholder believe in it as to be to be applied to to the Japanese market too. Okay, thank you very much, Jose. Um... Now, now we have uh, two questions, uh, which are with, they are not directed to any of the speakers. So I'll, let's see. And uh, I, I will merge two questions, one from Ali Azam and one from Alexander Atkov, because they, they, they have uh, uh, somewhat similar. And the, the questions are on uh, uh, whether you, there are, or you find synergies or complementarities between 
floating offshore wind structures and wave energy, or for example, aquaculture uh, in Japan or Portugal. I mean, uh, I don't know wh whoever wants to address it. Oh yeah, thank you. This is cool. Just I simply uh, question one thing, and the, obviously we have been uh, seeking this kind of uh, uh, combination of a, a wave or tidal and offshore wind. And the, in the past, the Japanese government has uh, uh, tried to develop some technology, but. Uh, as of now, as I have mentioned, that uh, uh, offshore wind, floating offshore wind, is the is most potential technology by which we can uh, obtain so-called uh, uh, UTD level of power. This is a first priority, but uh, in uh, uh, maybe longer, mid to longer term, in order to uh, accelerate uh, local economy, particularly in the remote island, yes, I think floating wind with combination with tidal or wave might be needed. This is a slightly uh, more regional development area, which obviously our government is looking for. But are yet to be uh, planned any uh, project yet. Thank you very much. Any any other comments from, from any, anyone else? Well, if yeah. not, I think, uh, go ahead, go Just ahead. Sorry. Very, very briefly. Uh, there's a great, I think ocean winds at the uh, seas that uh, Offshore floating wind farms have a great opportunity to are a great vehicle of 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 uh, coexistence with other uh, even technologies or or uses, being wave energy uh, or or uh, aquaculture or, or um, fishing far fishing farms or or seaweed farming as well. So that that is definitely the future. I think that we are. Um, uh, by deploying these large-scale offshore wind farms, we are uh, 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 not only occupying areas that eventually um, were occupied by others, uh, other uh, other sectors, uh, or potentially working close to to others. So there there needs to be this dialogue from from uh, early stages to to accommodate the different sectors. And to be creative in in this uh, in this relation with uh, with the other uh, with the other industries that uh, explore the 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 sea. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, Thank if, you I, if I may add, sorry, I forgot to add one thing. In Japan, uh, we have such kind of uh, uh, combination of renewable and uh, agri uh, agriculture kind of fish culture is happen in uh, Okinawa. Kumejima Island, which is uh, not wind, but uh, OTEC, Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion Technology deployment is uh, ongoing for a few years already in Okinawa Kumejima, which is uh, combined with uh, a fish, uh, kind of uh, uh, fish agriculture farm. And the, their income is uh, mainly come from growing seaweed and the uh, fish. And this is kind of, uh, uh, new, I think it's one of new business model uh, enabling uh, to make so-called local uh, remote island economy be viable. So therefore, why not with other renewable? Yes, well, good to know. In fact, I, I, this is new information for you. I wasn't aware. So this is, uh, we are always talking about, let's say, plans, but this is a concrete example in this case with OTEC, but of these synergies being being explored, which is, which is great to know. Um, so th then there's a question from Ryan Hastings on, uh, on uh, I will read it, what are the main and, and maximum depth that uh, can operate? And is there a sweet spot? I mean, uh, floating offshore wind, I mean, can anyone pick this perhaps principal power, I don't know. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. I mean, uh, basically, uh, you know, we can, you know, as you've seen from some of the slides, we can um, operate in waters you know, uh, over, you know, a thousand meters in water depth, um, potentially even more. Um, I think if there's a sweet spot, it, it's a little bit difficult because it, it depends on the, the project location and some other complexities. But I would say in general, you know, if you're looking at, you know, 100 to, you know, 300 meters water depth, that's certainly um, those slightly deeper waters are, uh, an area where um, you're going to see uh, wind wind float performing very well. 
Um, I think other technologies, you know, um, if you're looking at spar technologies, you know, again, they, they can also perform in very deep waters. So um, I think some of, the, some of the choice is maybe not so much about water depth, but more, you know, um, about other constraints related to port infrastructure or shipyards or uh, things like this. But we don't see water depth as being, uh, you know, a, a massive uh, constraint for um, many of the uh, floating offshore wind technologies. Yeah. I, I would just perhaps add a comment from my side. If I if I see any constraints, I would say are on the other side of the spectrum, right on the on the on the shallower uh, depth, uh, where basically floating would compete with bottom fixed. And for example, when you look at floating structures, some of them you named spar, but uh, uh, TLPs to some extent have some sort of limitations when you, when you talk. Uh, Relatively sh shallow waters. So, but I mean, thanks a lot for your uh, for your for your question. Any other comment from anyone? Okay, I will I will proceed. So there's one uh, perhaps to to Jose. Is there any future plan for further offshore wind platforms in in Portuguese waters? Of course, <laughs> that's a part of my job as well. Um, the, the Portuguese uh, uh, waters are uh, again very uh, are a very good environment for deploying. I think Portugal has as uh, some of the fundamentals for offshore floating wind. Uh, it's it's a, a it's a country that we all know that is is betting very much in the energy energy transition from a production point of view. Uh, it follows all the same the criteria for the goals of achieving neutrality, uh, being part of the uh, European Union. So, and the land that uh, we have uh, is is limited. It's quite limited, as we as we know. So, um, but uh, I, important that sometimes I I, I may seem a bit uh, misinterpreted uh, in these uh, regards. I think that the, in Portugal. Um, there is this great opportunity for developing a local supply chain, for continuing to de develop this local supply chain. Uh, there's a, a, a huge opportunity and value added to the economy of bet in betting in this new sector. But uh, the part that I don't want to be misread mis uh, is that it's not going to come and take over all over. <laughs> it's just going to be another part. It's going to be another contributor for the energy mix. We have a country where onshore wind is extremely well explored. It has a bit more potential through repowering. We have definitely a road to do in terms of, 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 of solar because the potential is there and needs to be, it needs to be explored in the good sense of the word. But then again, uh, we come to an end. We come to a dead road, uh, I believe, because electrification of the, the economy plus the targets that we need to, to achieve uh, hydrogen being there, uh, looking in the in the horizon. Um, there is probably a mathematically uh, equation that cannot be sorted without thinking about offshore wind, and in the case of Portugal, floating. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jose. Um, now, perhaps a question, perhaps to to Manabe. Uh, I mean, it's not addressed to you, but I mean, just to to have you participate as well. Um, it's uh, the question is from Dr. Ines Tunga is on whether uh, are you considering storage and flexibility solutions alongside floating wind development? Um, this is addressed to Jose, but I would suggest that Manabe also address this, for example, in Maru Beni's projects to see if there are any plans to use storage or green H2 coupled with your offshore wind uh, projects. Yeah, yes, uh, it's actually that depends on the, uh, the regulation and the requirement to the wind developer, actually. But uh, in generally uh, speaking, uh, we have the interest for the combination of the offshore wind and the storage solution to make the output or uh, the balance to adjust the grid requirement. So uh, judging from the economic the perspective on this, it's not the uh, ideal for development or for developer to install the storage to attach the offshore wind because it's just costly. And uh, we have to bear the capex and opex 
for the storage systems. But uh, in order to optimize the, the grid connection conditions and the balancing uh, the purposes, uh, we are considering the combination of the storage and offshoring. Actually, that requirement is already in place in Hokkaido area in Northern Ireland, in Japan. So uh, for some parts, we have to consider the solution for offshoring. Yep. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, if I may, Joao, as well, yes. jump very quickly. Yes, I would, I I would give be, the word now. <laughs> uh, sure. uh, so I think we need to be conscious and uh, about, about where we are with regards to offshore floating wind in terms of LCOE. If we keep on adding on other not so mature technologies to it, then uh, we will probably struggle to make a stand and, and, to, and to meet what we are uh, all trying to achieve, which is a competitive LCOE for the technology. So storage right now uh, uh, also needs to be seen more from a balancing point of view from the grid operation, uh, instead of always putting or, or tending to put it in on the side of the production. Um, there are other ways also to bring, to bring uh, uh, offshore floating and, and, and offshore wind in general to even uh, a more robust uh, uh, capacity in terms of energy delivery. And reliability and in and, and the fact that the wind varies throughout the, the day through also through hybridization as we know uh, we talked briefly before uh, through for instance wave energy but we also need to be conscious that it's a process that needs to to run its own matureness uh, road so uh, when coming to offshore floating wind i like very much the combination of innovation and the cumulative innovation through through some through the same, through the technology being a vehicle for other innovation to 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 be achieved, but we need to be conscious that if we want to to deliver what we what we say, we need to to somehow uh, not distract ourselves. Okay, thanks for your for sharing your perspective. Um, so I have a, uh, also one other question from George Cunha, uh, which is addressed again. Jose, you're on the spot. Uh, to Jose, but I, I think also to Principal Power, which is after the early patent technology of the platform from Principal Power, have you developed any other uh, patented, patented technology well, in the context of the wind float projects? I, I'm sorry, can you please repeat the question again? I couldn't quite catch it. The, the question was, uh, was on, uh, th there was, let's say, uh, original patented technology from Principal Power for the, for the wind flow technology. And the question was whether on the, let's say, on the course of the, the, the wind float project or, or the wind float athletic project, if you had new developments and new patents coming, coming in. Yeah, well, we're, um, that's a great question. We're always, uh, you know, um, increasing and, um, you know, working with our, with new patents and, um, in, you know, uh, expanding our patent portfolio. I mean, I think that there's just a lot of, um, you know, uh, potential applications of semi-sub technology, not just for floating offshore wind. Obviously, um, hydrogen production, I think, is one area where a lot of people have uh, looked at semi-sub and um, thought that that, you know, especially with like the Dolphin Project and others where there's a lot of potential. But, um, you know, other potential applications of our technology are for, uh, you know, floating offshore uh, wind substations. Um, so, I think um, as you move into deeper waters, a need for having uh, floating um, substations uh, increases. So, the, the, and then there's of course other technology that we look at for shallower waters for meeting some of those challenges, as you mentioned before, Joao, with um, very shallow waters. And um, if you have a very, for example, a very difficult seabed where it's difficult to do monopiles or it's difficult to do a deep water jacket, um, there's a potential for using um, floating technology and using uh, different types of mooring systems to, um, you know, in response to those very difficult, challenging geology and seabeds. So, yeah, we see um, a lot of potential. So, okay, thank you very much. Um, so then, there's one question from uh, uh, from Miguel Salgueiro Meira, which has been uh, partially addressed in a, in a previous question, which is on, let's say regarding the wind float Atlantic or whether there are uh, plans to move to a commercial phase and when? 
Well, but as I said, well, um, there there are plans. I keep uh, myself and, and the team uh, keep on looking at at um, the next stage. Uh, for us, the next stage, um, uh, it's it's really the the commercial phase of of these kind of technologies. For that, we need to have a, a clear and visible and transparent uh, regulation framework that allows uh, uh, the players to come and compete um, so that to deliver the best price as possible, the best proposal, uh, value proposal uh, as possible. That's our goal. Um, it's uh, in Portugal, uh, we clearly have this, this, this road to do. We see that, that there is potential and uh, we keep on working on that. It's definitely possible to do, to do that. We just need the legal uh, grounds to do. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, the, the questions keep piling up, which is a great sign. And our speakers are, are, are being generous enough to, to reply to all of them. So thank you very much. I think we still have time for two or three more. So now we have one from uh, Antonio Sarmento, from Professor Antonio Sarmento, uh, which is on a different topic, tsunamis. So tsunamis are understood as a major challenge for floating offshore wind in Japan. Uh, however, if deployed in waters uh, of 100 meters or more, uh, I would expect that the impact of tsunamis are, are maybe not so critical. I would like to ask the Japanese speakers how critical tsunamis are in their opinion, and if critical, what are the impacts on technology adaptation and costs? So to our Japanese colleagues. Okay, may I first answer to that? As far as that, I'm not a specialist for technological point of view, however, uh, when the tsunami came, uh, if the uh, far offshore impact to wind turbine is quite minimal. The, the most dangerous part of tsunami is uh, uh, breakwater near the shore, as you can see in the, what's happened in Fukushima area. So therefore, oh, as far as I was informed by the specialist, that the tsunami effect is uh, quite minimal for the far offshore floating offshore wind turbine. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I just want to some comments. Um, I think that David knows much deeper than myself as the principal power, but uh, we operated, we have operated the floating offshore wind in Fukushima for about eight years. And it's located about 20 kilometers far from our onshore site. Uh, unlike the uh, Fukushima disasters event, we don't have the huge tsunami for the uh, eight years, but we do have uh, some tsunami and earthquakes and the typhoon for eight years, but we have no experience to stop the border due to such a natural disaster event, fortunately. So I think the border is very, the, uh, the how to say, uh, can stand for such natural disaster, including the tsunami things, based on our experience in Fukushima. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Manabe. Uh, we still have lots of questions. I think we have time only for one more, because we stop at 10.15, just one more. Um, so there's a question from Philippe Vieira. I will follow my, let's say, chronological criteria. Philippe Vieira on uh, uh, the question is uh, any, modifica any modifications to the port space uh, for the wind flow structures required? Thank you. So on, the question is on, on adaptations to port infrastructure in order to, to build and assemble the wind floats. Perhaps to oh, Jose or to David. Yeah. That, that's, that's another great question. I, I think that the, um, the simple answer is, is that um, usually uh, besides cranes and some of the ancillary equipment and storage space and things like this that you would need, not just for the wind float, but also for the turbines and, and, and whatnot, you might need to be uh, strengthening uh, the concrete um, in you know, parts of the port, you know, because you're going to be having um, a lot of weight that's going to be lifted you know, by cranes or being moved around. Um, but I think the easy answer to your question is, is that there's not going to be massive, um, you know, port infrastructure investment required for something like wind float. I think um, depending on what the port, um, you know, what, what the technology or what kind of uh, infrastructure the port already has, there's a lot of ability 
to leverage that infrastructure with wind float and try to um, keep down uh, the cost that would be required to um, you know halt, you know make huge changes to the infrastructure. But again, it really depends on you know um, the plan, the execution plan for the project, and a lot of other factors. But I think that there are ways to you know do it in a very smart way to keep uh, the required investment down. Um, just adding. Yeah, you want to add? Yes, sir. Yeah, just adding to that. Uh, the, in specific, in, it's it's definitely a technology that is uh, probably the most uh, agile, uh, one of the most agile. Uh, others require much bigger areas in ports, but I think the the problem is not the technology itself; it's the volume of of uh, of what we can see in front of us in terms of five, ten years ahead. The volume of and we also have to think that we, there will not only be floating offshore wind. So the bottom fixed projects, we all will compete for the same infrastructures. And that is definitely the challenge. The challenge is to have enough places across the globe. And I, I normally think about Europe well, due to my normal duties of my work. That is a, an issue. Um, it's a challenge, but again, it's a great opportunity. Because if, if there's an overall approach to, to, to this as an industry, uh, uh, there is a high potential for improving port infrastructures of these countries that will commit to this new vector, which again will have an intangible uh, uh, or a side effect or a tangible side effect of more business, more capability to take other sectors too. So it's, it's just a question of putting the ball running. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. But just one very brief addition from my side, which is, uh, uh, I fully agree with what was said uh, on this question. But I mean, I think we are thinking a, a little bit about the present. Uh, if we think, let's say, beyond 15 megawatt turbines, uh, perhaps there we, we start seeing some more severe limitations to, to existing infrastructure. But I mean, uh, the challenge also would apply. To, to adapt it to, you know, to, to move forward the, the industry. Um, well, I think we, we, we concluded that we still had lots of time. I'm sorry not to take all the questions because it's not, not possible. I would like to thank uh, very much to all the speakers. This was, uh, we had great presentations, a very lively discussion. Uh, so thank you very much. It was a pleasure and uh, see, you, see you soon. Thank and, you very uh, much. The floor to Carolina. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, okay. so thank you. Uh, it was a great panel, great discussions and great questions. So once again, uh, I would like to remind you that you should type your questions in the Q&A function. Um, and now, uh, before we have the, the second session moderated by Ricardo Morgado, we would like to show you uh, one of the, the videos from one of our gold sponsors, uh, EDP. So, uh, see you in a few seconds.